Thanks, all of you, for waking up this early. I know this is, uh, this is a, a little bit unusual, and I, I, uh, I'm, I'm honored that, that you come together. What, um, what I'm going to try to do today is give a, a framework for how I see uh, certainly the key challenges of bringing intelligence into the enterprise. You know, my hope, especially after uh, Abhishek framed it so well, is that you know, people don't react to the phrase enterprise intelligence as if it's just an oxymoron, that this is something real but hard. Uh, and as you'll see from the title, the theme is in putting pieces together. And so while I have you all awake, kind of the, the, you know, the, the main takeaway from this talk is going to be that the, the biggest challenge in the enterprise is taking the various uh, streams of data that are necessary and having them available to combine in such a way as to unlock what we call uh, intelligence. Now, it, it's, uh, it's kind of a truism that you know, consumer technology is getting intelligent. But I think, you know, judging from the ages of folks in the room, uh, I hope people recognize that this has not always been the case. I mean, when, uh, if you think back to, say, the, the 80s, when you start to see early voice recognition, it sucked. Right? It, was, it was unusable. I mean, you had, you had uh, you know, companies like Dragon uh, that, that would be urging people to do discrete speech. Uh, you had some attempts at, say, natural language interfaces, but they were very kludgy. If, if anything, right, AI was a phrase that you didn't see used because I mean, it was used for anything that didn't work. But now, intelligent and consumer is taken for granted. In fact, uh, a, a colleague of, of mine, Monica Rigotti, coined the phrase data native. And by that, what she means is that you have people who expect their applications to be intelligent. They expect that when they go to a shopping site like Amazon or a, you know, a site like Netflix to consume media, that the recommendations are relevant and personalized, as opposed to not that long before, where your expectation was, well, look, if, if I type in exactly what I want, I should be able to find it. And uh, I, you know, I think the, the, uh, the echo pictured here, where people are requesting services like, like Uber's, uh, is, is really emblematic of the current expectations and reality of intelligence in the consumer world. In contrast, enterprise technology is still the opposite of intelligent in most scenarios. And here, let, let's be, uh, when we're talking about enterprise technology, to, to drill down a bit from, from how Abhishek framed it, we're talking about the financial applications, sales, HR, accounting. And I mean, these may feel very boring, very mundane. I don't know how many folks in this room work in those. Uh, I'm sure that anybody here uh, in either industry or in academia has had to work with these applications. And nobody, to my knowledge, jumps into them thinking, wow, the system I'm using to report expenses is intelligent. Or that uh, when, I, when I'm going through uh, my HR system, to figure out anything from, say, what benefits I need to uh, dealing with the hiring process at my company, that, that this is where AI is coming to play. I think sales is perhaps um, one of the places where there's been the most success simply because uh, you know, there's, there's so much money at stake. But even there, uh, you know, the, um, the difference I think, between consumer enterprise is a very, very yawning gap. And that's how I would certainly characterize you know the current state of, of intelligence in the, in the enterprise. And it's not a surprise is that this is the first workshop on this. Uh, this isn't an area where we're simply you know, celebrating the victories. I think we're trying to achieve some. Now, uh, it's not as if the enterprise doesn't matter. Right? We, we spend not only you know, say a, a third uh, of our time, in many cases, uh, in the enterprises, but that's actually where we make almost all of our money. Uh, and in, you know, can produce so much of the value in society. So uh, the only reason, surely, that we don't have the enterprise intelligence we want is, is that it's hard. So let's, let, let's talk about what makes it hard. And I see three, three main challenges. The first is that the data lives in silos. Now, it's funny that it, the, 
the challenges of data in silos are one of these things that uh, it seems to be an evergreen problem. I remember when I started at, uh, at LinkedIn in 2010, the biggest challenge was that the data was in silos. And I'm pretty sure that you know, when I left about a year ago, the biggest challenge was still that the data was in silos. And it's not that people don't recognize the problem or try to do something about it. It's that this is sort of a natural consequence of the way uh, that data uh, organically comes to be uh, in enterprise settings. Um, and very often, it's because the, the data comes from different systems. People develop those systems independently. If those systems are proprietary, there aren't necessarily the right sorts of hooks to send data among them. Uh, but uh, we can make all the excuses we want. The problem is that when the data is separated this way, uh, it becomes extremely difficult to derive what we think of as intelligence from it. Right? Because generally, intelligence comes from joining across uh, data sets. It's, right, it's by connecting these data assets that we unlock their value. You know, if I go back to the consumer examples, if you look at the places we see what we think of as intelligence most in the consumer world, they're in some of the largest companies. There are places like Google, or like Facebook, or like Apple, uh, Amazon. And you could say, well, fine, there's one company. What, what, you know, what does this mean about data sets? But right at Google, it's a big deal when they said, well, we can actually combine uh, you know, the data that you have, whether it's how you're doing search, using your calendar, using maps, uh, watching videos. Uh, at Amazon, uh, you know, practically the entirety of your shopping uh, life is there. Uh, and it's not surprising they're trying to uh, you know, get people uh, using mobile devices that they themselves are creating. Uh, Apple, for many people, is, is the primary gateway uh, to online consumption. So all these places naturally have many different kinds of data to put together in order to deliver those experiences. In contrast, it's likely in an enterprise setting that uh, the scope of one of these systems is much narrower. And so as a result, the, uh, you know, if you're using, uh, for example, a, a sales application, the information about um, who are the other salespeople that you work with might be in an, another application entirely. Uh, in in uh, the hiring system that is determining if a candidate is going to be hired, doesn't know anything about the emails going back and forth with that candidate because that's, those aren't in the applicant tracking system. Right? The, 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 this kind of narrowness of scope, because these are typically different software produced by different companies or developed by different teams, uh, is a huge challenge as compared to the, the consumer, consumer analog. The second challenge is that uh, compared to the consumer world, the, um, the enterprise finds the signals to be very weak. Right? Another way of thinking about uh, intelligence is that it's the extraction of, of signal from noise or signal from data at all. And I mean, actually, I'm using the word signal here, but in many cases, even just the sort of raw inputs are, are sparse, let alone uh, anything that you could derive useful signal from. And you know, I, I spent uh, a fair amount of my career working on search problems. And in particular, uh, the, the company that, that Abhishek alluded to, Indeca, worked in enterprise search, whether that was for uh, e-commerce, for uh, internal search systems. You know, the typical uh, expectation people were, would have would be, well, uh, Google's pretty good. Why can't you do that for our company? I mean, hey. Google's trying to do search for the entire web, and we only have a few million documents, and you know everything about us and our people, it should be better, right? And you know, I thought we did an OK job under the circumstances, but by no means could we ever deliver in the enterprise the quality of search that you could get on the web. So we needed some excuses. And this slide was designed to have precisely those excuses. And they're basically that, well, we don't have labels the way that you do on the web. Right? Because in the, in the web, you have uh, anchors, you have all sorts, uh, you have uh, ultimately label, labels actually for, through behavioral data. But if you want to know what a document is about, you have a lot of ways of finding that out. 
If you want to know whether people like a document, you have enough people who are looking at that document or linking to that document uh, that you can derive uh, reputational signals from that. And uh, search, I think, is one of the easiest examples in which to see that. But this is just as true uh, of any situation where uh, you essentially want to know for your content how to characterize it uh, as well as how to assess its quality. Now let's look at what happens in the enterprise setting. The, you, know, you don't have much in the way of labeling or tagging because while in the consumer setting, the annotating that data has some immediate value. Right? The, um, uh, for example, if, if I'm actually putting something on the web, I want it to be found. If I am uh, selling something, I want it to be discoverable for the right reasons. And then also on, on, on the web, in the, or rather in the consumer world, generally, uh, there are a lot of things for which you have a relatively small amount of target content that a large amount of people are coming to. In the enterprise setting, it's almost the opposite. You have huge volumes of content. The people creating it couldn't care less in many cases um, how it's discovered. And certainly, it is not their day job to make that content as richly annotated as possible. And on top of that, I mean, in a company with you know, a few hundred, a few thousand people, you don't have sort of the, the kind of mass of, of behavioral data that you can derive large amounts of insight from about you know, what, what's the most useful uh, HR document or uh, you know, who are the people who work most closely with someone. You have to put in a lot more work to, to derive that same quality of, of, uh, of signal uh, from the inputs available. So I actually think that's the, the, sort of the, uh, the biggest kind of data, data challenge uh, beyond, as I said earlier, that on top of that, what data you have often isn't combined well together. The third challenge, it's interesting. It, it's not a technical challenge at all, but it's that the enterprise has very different incentives uh, than the, the consumer world. And I was alluding to this uh, just a moment ago, that in the consumer world, if you uh, make the, the data uh, more accessible, more discoverable, uh, better characterized, you're probably doing that because that's the way you'll sell something. Right? Like the, uh, uh, the, the, the ability to, uh, to understand and access that data directly translates into the business model uh, that, that, that you have in mind. While in contrast, in, inside of enterprise settings, the get, getting that, that data to be uh, sort of a useful form is often an afterthought. It's not, I mean, it's something you recognize as important, but you really wish somebody else would do. It's not, it's not your day job, right? Like going back to the example of a salesperson, of course, it would be great if every sale that you do uh, is well characterized. You know, who is the company? Who is the person that, that did this? Uh, what field are they in? Was it a director or a VP who was the contact and so forth? You just want to close the damn sale. Or you don't actually like, you'd love to you know, like you would love for this beautiful rich data asset to exist for the, you know you wish somebody had done that for you but you're not necessarily as interested in making this data available for the next person uh, who would benefit from it perhaps the most extreme example of that is you look at something like wikipedia and wikipedia is phenomenal and if you look at the um, you know it's kind of amazing to see uh, a resource like Wikipedia exist uh, that has this knowledge sharing available to, uh, to the world, and particularly to the English-speaking world. Um, so a lot of companies think, well, we should make our own Wikipedia. In fact, I remember back in 99, uh, a small company I joined had this thing called the Internal Assets Network. Like, we're going to convince everyone to build wikis. And I'm sure, uh, for those of you who work in industry, show of hands, folks who have internal wikis. OK. Now, show of hands for folks who think of that as a better source of knowledge than just going to the outside web to find the same information. Right. I'm sure there, there, there are some isolated cases. And of course, you'd hope that if you want to find out about your project, you're more likely to find it internally. But the outside web turns out to often be better, even though you think the internal one would, would have exactly the information you need. 
but it's a issue of incentives. If I edit a Wikipedia page, you know, uh, hopefully at least hundreds, thousands, maybe even millions of people will look at it. If I edit the same kind of content inside of my company, a handful will. And actually, by the way, even that is hardly enough incentive to get most people to, uh, to contribute to things like Wikipedia. But then you've got such a massive user base that even you know, a fraction of a percent participation is enough to create this. Well, fraction of percent participation in the workplace doesn't give you squat. But so you know, everyone within organizations, at least that I've, I've worked in, clearly values data reuse and you know, promotes knowledge sharing. But it's not rewarded. Right. And, and that's, this is the other thing, is that um, within, uh, uh, within most organizational settings, your job is, you know, is, is to deliver on wh whatever, your, uh, whatever your objectives are, whatever your goals are. And this kind of good citizenship of making data available to others, making the information and knowledge you have available to others, it's not something that is explicitly rewarded, and it's very difficult, I think, uh, to reward it, but, uh, but not impossible. In fact, uh, uh, just a, uh, an example I remember from my time at Google is that there was a, a citizenship award that was explicitly for, for this kind of purpose. But I think it's the exception. I think that, in general, uh, is one of these apple pie things that everyone says, oh, you know, we should get better at, at, uh, at making our data reusable and shareable, but the lack of incentives mean that people instead just, again, continue in, in their very silo tracks. So, so, well, I've just explained to you why enterprise intelligence is you know, behind relative to consumer. Uh, but I, my understanding for keynotes is it's traditional to have a more uplifting message rather than a completely negative one, especially at 8 in the morning. So, you know, I, and I do, I do see that, uh, that uh, there are some signs of life. So I'd like to, uh, to see, you know, to, to go into what those are. Um, and the first is open source. Uh, and people, you know, open source is hardly new. But I think that uh, in, in enterprise settings, there really is a difference. Uh, you know, I remember you know, not, not that many years ago uh, that when you looked at, at the software people were using inside of enterprises, it was largely proprietary, and, uh, and that, that was sort of the thought of the sort of normal way to go. And now, uh, in, uh, at least in what I've seen, particularly in sort of smaller companies, it's taken for granted that you'll build on top of open source stacks. Not always, and sometimes it's a factor of, it's just a function of money, uh, but often it's, the, you know, it's that desire to be able to tinker. It's also just the fact that the, the maturity uh, of open source software has gotten much better. And it's not just that, uh, that you have, you know, it's cheaper, you have flexibility, but uh, I think that, that uh, open source is just dramatically, uh, you know, sort of reduced overall barriers to, to adoption. So people don't say now, uh, well, you know, if, if I want to do a, say, you know, something with machine learning, right? I'm going to, uh, I, you don't think I need to find some kind of a, pa of a, of a proprietary package out there. I mean, all of us were you know, using things like uh, MLlib or you know, scikit-learn or whatever it's going to be. Uh, and if we, we build increasingly on top of those sorts of packages, it's going to also be scary that people will use uh, open source software without necessarily understanding what's inside it. But I think that, um, the, uh, the cost of getting started with building applications has gotten, gotten much lower. And it's not just um, that the software itself is available, but you typically are, are going to be using uh, more open standards that, that encourage interoperability. Right? You'll be, you know, every, everything, for example, if it's using uh, search context, we'll use some Lucene compatible store that's become more normal. Uh, or uh, you might standardize on some kind of a, of a key value store. You might, you know, you'll use something like Avro, but the, the for for representation, the uh, the sort of mentality with, with open source and open standards has, has made it easier to sort of stand things up in the first place. 
but also has, has uh, encouraged people to, to put things together better. So I, uh, I think that this is something that you know, has been certainly bubbling over the past uh, decade, decade and a half. But I feel it's, it's, hit, it's hit critical mass where the first impulse uh, of most companies now is you know, what is an open source package uh, that we can use to do something as opposed to um, who has built a proprietary package that will do it for us. The second is cloud, uh, cloud computing. Again, hardly new, uh, but uh, this is, uh, I, I think that uh, again, say a decade ago, uh, when you start seeing uh, cloud computing coming up, it's for toy projects. Right? It's like, oh, like well, of course we're going to do our things in our in our data centers, but you know maybe uh, we'll try this thing on AWS. Now uh, it's hard hard to imagine someone starting a company today that's going to have a massive amount of data and not starting whether it's on AWS or Azure or Google Cloud. Right? You'd be out of your mind to say, well, the first thing we're going to do is build a data center. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the number of companies that, that uh, at this point have their own data centers is, is, uh, at, at some kind of scale is, is getting smaller because the, uh, very few people want this as a, as a, a core competency. Uh, but now the, the, the flip side of that is that uh, you don't need to be, you know, a Google or a LinkedIn or a Facebook to, to uh, Microsoft to, to justify having large amounts of data because it, I mean, it used to be that actually doing the kinds of things that cloud computing is designed for uh, was a massive barrier to entry, but it's not now. So um, the uh, I remember and this is this is a while ago, but a friend of mine at the New York Times wanted to do uh, so just some a categorization exercise and did it for like a few dollars. Uh, just by you know shipping that to AWS, and at the time that was exciting. Now it's just like, yeah, of course. And and, and it's not just by the way that uh, you have the access to you know the storage, the computation. It's that because this has become a standard, everyone is building sort of on top of this stack, right? You can actually say, well, you know, how if I'm doing things in, in the cloud, but um, where is all the software going to live? I'm used to having software, you know, on my own, on my own iron, on my own boxes. So, no, I mean, everything runs in the cloud now. So, like, you, you basically, I mean, it's true that maybe historically you'd be saying, well, I'm going to have this virtualized Linux box. I'm going to uh, you know, install software there, create that environment. But increasingly, you have services that you can run, uh, you know, on top of of AWS or Azure or Google that do what you need. So. The cloud as an abstraction, I think, has gotten beyond just uh, cheap compute or, or elastic uh, resources. It's become uh, the, the place where you get uh, a large enough amount of the stack that you know, some people have said that you know, a lot of software engineering has become reduced to saying just like picking and choosing the pieces, almost, almost a system integration. I think like, we still have jobs for a while. but the. Uh, uh, but that I see as, as a, a big benefit that the cloud has been bringing. And the other is that, you know, Abhishek alluded, you know, the, the consumer, consumerization of the enterprise certainly has uh, uh, placed a lot of emphasis on, on usability. But it's also that uh, you know, people are increasingly using the same applications uh, for both. A consumer and enterprise, and I think that's uh, there's a lot of benefit there. I remember in the early days of Gmail, spelling correction uh, was terrible, right? like, and it was really ironic. I mean, it was Google. Like, this is like the uh, you read, you know, Peter Norvig's blog post how to build a spell correction, and you think, yeah, that's great. Then why can't you do this in the tool that I'm using all the time, uh, particularly within the enterprise? And you look today. Uh, and it's actually it's actually pretty good, um, and I think a, a lot of that is the, the benefit you get that you're taking uh, what an application that has a massive uh, consumer base, and even Gmail itself was originally, even though it was consumer, um, the way it was siloed by uh, user had a very enterprisey feel, but uh, you have this this massive use from web search, and you're able to learn from that, and you're able to develop the sort of noisy channel, channel models and, and, and bring them over. 
So the, um, uh, I, I believe that as uh, consumer applications themselves uh, are being uh, you know, ported or placed in enterprise settings, and many of these, there's almost no difference between the kind of application. I mean, it's, it's typically more a matter of, of administrative changes as opposed to uh, the application changes themselves. You have the possibility of just directly leveraging what's going on in the consumer world in enterprise settings. Uh, so, um, but the other thing is that much as we've gotten used to a certain degree of interoperability in the consumer world, we're starting to exp expect that in the enterprise. So a nice example is, is Slack, that uh, increasingly you see uh, companies that are building their, their businesses effectively as, as integrations with Slack. And for those uh, folks who are familiar with Slack, show of hands. OK, so I won't explain it, right? But if, if you've used any of the, the bots that integrate with it as a collaboration platform, I mean, people are using Slack now to uh, integrate it within their um, uh, hiring workflows, within their uh, you know, sort of, uh, bug reporting uh, flows as well, which means that uh, now you have the possibility that you can bring these things together, certainly within, within Slack as a platform. But more importantly, it's forcing an attitude that breaks the silos between, uh, between those in the first place. And uh, I mean, obviously, it's the benefit, benefit of a company like Slack if it happens all there. But I think it, it, my hope, at least, is that it starts to uh, make this pattern more normal where uh, the different parts of uh, people's, different, people's different systems in the enterprise work together. Um, so, uh, right, I, mean, I, I see, uh, you know, open open source and standards, the um, uh, you know, cloud computing, and this kind of consumerization as you know, bring, bringing the enterprise forward, and in particular that they're uh, they're doing it a lot a lot to make it easier to get these uh, this data available, uh, accessible, interoperable. Uh, as I said, you know the, the, the theme here is really that you know we need to be able to put the pieces uh, together. So what can we what can we do with that? I'd like to talk about uh, three. Uh, as as I warned in the beginning, this is you know this is the fluffy keynote, right? These are just general frameworks for uh, for ideas, but hopefully they're they're uh, applicable to some of your uh, uh, some some of your immediate context. So let's talk about some opportunities to make things better. One is to combine public and enterprise data. And I think that uh, here we have to accept a reality that the data within your enterprise is still going to be small, right? Unless you're a massive enterprise, right? Like I was talking with some folks the other day about uh, analysis, you know, people ops in HR. That's great if you're, you know, Google is large enough to do that. There are you know, probably, uh, there are a few hundred companies that are. But if you're you know, 100, 200 person company, you're not going to be able to do meaningful analysis of people operations, but you might be able to learn uh, from what else is out there. If you're um, doing things with, with location data, surely you want to grab access to public location data as well. And so I, I believe that if you're not reusing public data and somehow joining that to your enterprise data, you're, you're missing out on, on something enormous. And uh, the uh, the nice thing is that uh, a, a lot of folks uh, are either volunteering or in, in, in many cases you know trying to make businesses out of uh, making their their data an API call away right you know obviously uh, Google and Bing are great examples of this but uh, you know, if you if you want to be uh, looking at language and trying to understand that. Maybe you're grabbing something like the, the uh, Ngram data set from Google, or maybe uh, you're going and uh, doing searches on, um, on Bing to validate uh, how your spelling correction works uh, compared, to, compared to theirs. Um, this strikes me as something that, that is still underutilized. And I think, again, it's gotten just that much easier over time that uh, people should do more there. And you know, your data is small, so the question is, right, like how do you how to leverage, leverage what's large out there? But 
even if your data is small, you do have a, usually an advantage is that your data is, is small but deep. Right? So public data tends to be uh, very, very big but somewhat shallow. And uh, that actually you know, not only means that there's an opportunity to combine them in a useful way, but in particular kind of get the best of both worlds because you want to take the combine the, the differentiation you have by the deep knowledge of your data, uh, but at the same time benefit from breadth out there. And there's uh, some work that Jawbone did I found interesting where uh, they were looking at sleep data. As for those not familiar, Jawbone sells uh, these little bands people go around with that uh, measure their activity. Well, uh, they do all right in terms of sales there, but there it turns out is uh, a, a lot more data that was out there about people's movements, about locations. And so when they wanted to analyze their data, they, they, uh, they combine these, right? They're doing these kinds of little joins that are against their data sets that have, uh, you know, sort of way, way more columns, if you will, against the, the data sets that have way more rows to come up with interesting analyses to understand people's activity. Um, it, it's, again, so the kind of thing that's obvious when you look at it, but I don't see enough of it, uh, enough of it going on. And it seems like a natural way to combine enterprise and public data to get the best of both. The second thing, and I, I see Igor in the back there, uh, data standardization. Uh, the, uh, uh, this was also, I talked about silos being uh, uh, an issue my entire time at LinkedIn. I think this is probably one of the biggest uh, issues that we came, came into. And just to be clear what I mean by this, um, I mean having, having data in a way that uh, you can use it across different assets and everything, you know, things mean the same thing. Your entity names are the same. Uh, you could never, in my view, you know, you're never done with this in an enterprise setting, but I also think that um, people don't do enough of it. Uh, I was just talking to, uh, to so, some folks in, um, the other day and they were recognizing that um, they didn't have standards for uh, types of events and different uh, databases. Like the way that it would look uh, in one system was different than in another. And uh, let's be clear, making sure that your data is represented in the same way everywhere, that your tokens mean the same thing, is a pain in the ass. But it, it's the only way you can hope to do these kinds of joins. I mean, if, if your data is represented in strings, it's true that you can do all sorts of fun analyses of them. Like you can plug uh, features into machine learning models and hope they pick up what you need. You can use shingles. You can, I mean, there's a lot that you can do with unstructured data, and sometimes you have no choice. But one of the advantages of being in an enterprise setting is that you have the opportunity to standardize the way that you represent entities, and then you can do meaningful analytics over it. And the uh, this is the boring plumbing work of, of uh, being in, in, working with enterprise data, but I think that uh, it's, it's perhaps the, the highest value activity uh, that people can be doing with it. And you know, at the bare minimum, have internal consistency with how you represent data. But I think it's, what's even better is if you can find uh, standards uh, with broad support. So for example, if you're going to be working with labor data, it turns out that, at least in the United States, we have a Bureau of Labor Statistics, which is made SOC code. So uh, why not uh, actually use those representations rather than your own? And one of the challenges here, by the way, is that those, those standards are not perfect. Right? And any standard that's been built, I mean, the, uh, there, it may be that even at the time somebody thought we could have used that, but we built our own because our own would be better. That's probably true, but later when you want to join again someone else's data set, you start to realize the, uh, that you wish that everybody had adhered to the standard. It's the whole point of standards is that they bring, uh, they, have, they unlock the possibility of bringing data sets together. Uh, but I see enough folks who don't even have internally consistent uh, data, and that's unforgivable. Right there you're just, uh, it's like you've decided that you have a bunch of needles and you're going to throw them into haystacks to try to find them later. You have the possibility of a beautifully organized world uh, so make that your minimum whether or not you conform to uh, 
public standards. Um, and finally, create better incentives. This one, so the good news here is that uh, you know, this is technically speaking not a technical problem. Right? The, the, if we want to say that, that we think that uh, data should be available elsewhere, all we've got to do is you know, sort of recognize and reward uh, the behavior that we want. Now, I mean, the problem here is, of course, everybody does want to access everyone's data. But nobody wants to invest effort. This is the canonical example of, of a tragedy of the commons. So you know, what, can we, what can we do about that? And it's clear that, that what, we, what we need to do here is to, is, is to reward people who create data assets. Um, now, the nice thing is if you actually track the use of data assets, then I mean, you have to be careful that people don't game this. But you should be rewarding people inside of organizations based on the use of the things that they create. I mean, in the, um, uh, at LinkedIn, the, the, uh, there was a concept of uh, craftsmanship, which was a little bit fuzzy. But at least to the extent that, that, that uh, I found value in it, it's that you were using you know, the, the, the tools that were out there effectively and creating the tools that would then be, be reused. And again, this is one of these things that when you look at it globally makes a lot of sense. But the challenge when you look at it individually, uh, very often you'll find that people are rewarded for building something from scratch. They're rewarded in some ways for the size of what they build rather than uh, for either they, they should be you know, rewarded because they did as little work as possible because they were leveraging uh, the assets that were out there, uh, in which case uh, you should be saying, hey, you, you, know, you worked efficiently. Or they're investing a lot in building assets, but that's being amortized over their use elsewhere. Now, the beauty of both of those cases is that you know, everybody wins because you're basically saying, look, if you could have reused something, we're going to reward you for the small denominator in your return on investment. If you're building something that other people uh, use effectively, you're, re you're rewarding people for the high return on the comparably large investment because of that amortization. The key is that you have to be explicit about it. You have to say that, that the, um, you're tracking uh, asset reuse. But uh, you can accomplish some of that by logging, some of that by sort of manual effort. But I think that uh, this is, has to be a core activity of the organization. And uh, that, um, uh, yeah, th th this more than anything in my mind is, is what's necessary to get uh, a culture of data reuse. You need this kind of reward and recognition of it. So summarize, and yes, we're going to end a little bit early. It is, it is an early talk. I also want to leave time for, for uh, Q&A, because hopefully I've uh, provoked a few people. Uh, we have that uh, you know, open source cloud computing and consumerization, which are really kind of, they're doing two things. Right? They're lowering the barriers to do this kind of work. And they're also raising expectations, which I, I hope is acting as a forcing function so that uh, people feel the need to build uh, intelligence into these applications. You know, what do we need to do? We need to break down the, the silos uh, between these data assets. We need to strengthen uh, the, the signals uh, that, that are available. And, uh, you know, and we need to, to increase the incentives. Uh, to, that actually result in the, in the standardization sharing of this data, because you know there's a look, there's a lot we can do with better algorithms with machine learning, but uh, ultimately you know enterprise intelligence, it, it's really just about uh, what we can achieve when we put all these pieces together. And with that, I want to thank you and open the floor for questions. So the question is, what, what efforts have I seen to, to, um, like how to, to measure, measure the impact of new improvements people try to make? So I, I think that you know, one of the challenges with the term as broad as, as intelligence is that, that uh, typically you have to be sort of more, more specific in what, what you're looking to measure. Right? But um, the, uh, you know, certainly, if you're trying to help uh, with lead generation uh, for sales or marketing campaigns, then it's fairly straightforward to say, well, before we were letting people 
uh, sort of do it themselves or do SQL queries or whatever it is to grab those, uh, we now have uh, a key performance indicator of you know, how many leads convert or where things go in the funnel. And we're applying uh, something that is, is, is you know, being smart about it. Instead, so it's, it's no different, I think, than any experimentation that would happen in the consumer world. Where you're saying, look, let's either uh, you can either try to A/B test or do before and after. I do think one of the challenges with uh, measurement in enterprise settings is that A/B testing tends to be harder because you have less data, because uh, it's much harder to make randomized splits the way that you could do in a in a consumer setting. You often don't have the possibility of controlled experiments, so you have to do what I would jokingly call um, sequential A-B testing, which I mean, obviously isn't really A-B testing because you're not, uh, you can't do controls. With that said, often you just want to see if some number goes up. So if it turns out that sorting your leads by some scoring algorithm does better than uh, a, you know, just allowing people to chase whatever they wanted to do, or uh, the, I mean, the, the, the same with any of these other systems. You have to figure out what it is you're trying to uh, optimize and then see, did, did it move? And I'm not sure uh, that's a satisfying answer, but I think that the, uh, the reason you're investing in any of these activities is that you, there is some output that you want to improve. The good news in an enterprise setting is that uh, it is all about outputs. I mean, those outputs typically can, you know, translate to revenue or growth or, or some other key measure. So those are actually, uh, those should be fairly available. It's a, it's a good question. How, how do, how do um, security and privacy concerns, are they different in the enterprise than in, in uh, consumer? And in particular, uh, you, there's uh, sometimes the siloing is by design that you want to say, hey, I have different customers. And they can't, you know, the, there's what uh, people have historically called a Chinese wall between uh, different um, customers. So it, what's funny is that actually, uh, Consumers are a little bit concerned about uh, privacy as well. In fact, in some cases, uh, there's a greater degree of concern. Right? The, the, um, uh, if you, the, in your employment contract, typically the first thing you do is, is you sign something saying that anything you do on the hardware is available to your employer, which uh, kind of makes sense. Although uh, I, I know uh, people freak out about it, uh, in, in fact, uh, I remember when I saw something about uh, Slack announcing some feature that where there would be this, and I was like, well, sure. I've, I've been a Google Apps admin, and in theory, I had access to all of the emails within uh, the, uh, the company. That's just how these things work. And of course, if you abuse that, uh, you, you lose uh, your employees. Now, that's employees. I think that um, certainly uh, with customer data, and in particular, the risk of leakage between one customer and another, that becomes more of an issue. And there you have to be a bit more nuanced. Because after all, if you think about it, so let's say back when, when I was uh, working at, uh, at Indeca, and our, a lot of our customers were retailers. And a lot of our customers were retailers competing with one another. So of course, we don't hand the logs from one retailer over to another. I mean, that, that would be just an explicit violation. But let's say that we learn that some uh, approach to relevance works better for, say, selling apparel. I mean, you've got to understand, we're going to use that across the board, that, that kind of intellectual property is not going to be siloed. It, it's really impossible to do that. So it's a matter of degree. I think that uh, it, the, the clearly sending raw data across is a bit of a challenge, and yet, if you think about it, the ultimate level of abstraction where you learn something, you can't really break down this way. And then there can be things in between where it's like, oh, well, we learned some, we learned some nice models that at this stage have completely um, uh, obfuscated any of the raw inputs that were used. Is that derivative data that can't be sent across? You know, lawyers can, can, uh, uh, can quibble over that. But I don't think it's a privacy or security issue at that point. There, it becomes more of a, uh, of a, of a competitiveness one. So I think that uh, there are certainly areas that you have to be extremely careful. For example, when you're working with healthcare data or finance data, um, that's so sensitive that you have to be, uh, you know, you have to be absolutely sure 
that you're not inadvertently, say, by sharing some aggregate across uh, undermining the privacy or security uh, that's inherent in the raw data. I think as you go up the stack, though, there's actually a, a lot of opportunity uh, for reuse. If anything, that you have to be more careful that the data uh, should be reused. Right? You get into the more of kind of a transfer learning scenario where the risk is that you're going to apply it the wrong context. But I'll say that that uh, uh, I don't think these are showstoppers. So the question is like. Why would you need public data if, if there's so much data inside the enterprise? I mean, the, um, I'd say that you might not, right? If you've got 10,000 uh, employees, and depending on the kind of data uh, that you're interested in, for example, you know, if it's their uh, uh, work activities, if you're, for example, uh, yeah, trying to find out sort of their daily workflows, yeah, 10,000 is, is, uh, is pretty good. I also think that uh, you know, most companies are not uh, 10,000 plus. So uh, at the very least, I would say, you know, as you start to get into the tail, uh, they ideally want to learn from the experiences of companies of that size. But I do wonder that even at 10,000, let's say that uh, you want to learn about a segment of those uh, employees that's small. You, will have, you, you At any size, you eventually get segments that are, are, are too small uh, to learn from. Or if you're trying to find out uh, you know, whether, whether it be uh, geography, the kinds of people, and so forth. I mean, the, without knowing the specifics, it's hard to, to gauge where those, those opportunities might live. Also, like, it, the interesting question would be you know, what, what kind of, of data that you have. For example, if you're interested in your employees' uh, commuting patterns, it's true that you could get some things by you know, what they volunteer, when they're on their laptops, but you know, the, the commuting data is public. Right? You could just grab that uh, publicly and, and learn from that. So my, uh, uh, I still, as a, a sort of at first principle, would say when you're trying to, to find out some information, is that public uh, data available? Is it relevant? But it, you know, much as I was trying to go with the example of Jawbone, there's no question that you're going to have more depth in, in the data uh, that is proprietary. And so you, know, you have to decide, is it, it, do you get a benefit from uh, what, what is broader and shallower uh, that's out there? With, again, without knowing the specifics, it's hard to know whether there's a real case. OK, so, you're talking, uh, so for cybersecurity, I mean, that, but that's, a, that's actually, I mean, it's, uh, that's a case where, where there's been, people have been begging for uh, more sharing of data so that you can catch you know, zero, you know, zero, zero days would be caught so much more quickly, right? If, if you knew that, that another company had them, to actually go back to, to the question there, there, it's a no-brainer that as embarrassing as it might be for you, it be your company that hits it, you would like, ideally, the largest company out there should be hitting the problem slightly earlier than you, and maybe even the company where their employees uh, wake up earlier than you. I mean, so that, that's just in the case of, of say, something like uh, uh, a zero-day detection. But, but other patterns, one of the things with, with, um, uh, with, with the way people use machines, I'm guessing that there's a lot of commonality across organizations there. And that your own organization, I mean, you'll have some things that are unique, some pieces of software in that organization that are only there and so forth, and maybe some particular applications. But there's also. Uh, probably way more in common than is, that is unique. But I'm sorry, I interrupted you. I don't know if there's, there's more there. Right, so the question is, is, is how to deal with the semantics when you're doing data degradation. And it, uh, the, um, uh, depending on the data sets that you have, that can be increasingly difficult, right? I mean, if you have column names that you're like, you have no idea what they mean compared to others, or you have different taxonomies. So, I mean, the first thing is that, like, if, if you're doing this from scratch, like, it's just pain, right? Like you're saying, okay, you'll have to, there, there's no, uh, I, I don't have a silver bullet there. What I can say is that um, this is the reason why uh, you invest in data standardization. So you or, you know, master data management or whatever you want to call it. But basically, you're saying, okay, great, I'm going to, uh, to, to start seeing, okay, th these are, you know, this is domain or this is a set of entities I really care about. Uh, and you force people into a common standard uh, in those areas. Uh, so you're able to do those joints, you're able to do uh, uh, those analytics. I think you can do it incrementally. Right? I think that, that uh, there are going to be, like, if what you care about are customers, well then 
you know, you start saying, I really need to understand what a customer ID is. Like, well, but some people have subsidiaries. Great. We're going to figure out like some notion of like how to represent parent companies, subsidiaries, and so forth. And you may have, you know, hundreds of other fields that are uh, are not standardized at all. They may be just random notes that people have typed in. Hell, you might even have dates in inconsistent formats, and you live with that for a while. Uh, but deriving those uh, those fields becomes the thing that that you bootstrap to put them together. This the the other thing too is that uh, if you're using so if you're integrating your own data, uh, the bad news is it, it's often sadly it's some of the lowest quality because it was generated by whoever needed it for their purpose at the time. But as an organization, you have the most control over uh, evolving that representation. By the way, backfilling the way you wish it had done, I know, is a, is a challenge in and of itself. But you have to come up with some kind of a grandfathering approach eventually, or accept that you can only do this moving forward. The good news with public data is that it's more likely to be in a standard form, which in turn then says that like, if you're going to, if, if you see an opportunity to make use of public data, uh, it's in your interest to try to conform to the standards uh, that are being used and use, you know, live in that ID space. Uh, so, uh, I mean, again, neither of these are silver bullets. They're more like, how do you invest differently to take advantage of that? You know, I don't know, so the question is, you know, what is the min minimum size of an enterprise where these techniques apply? I think that um, it's, it, it, you know, it depends on what, you know, kind of, what it means to talk about intelligence. Just as an example, let's say that, that uh, you're, in, you're doing hiring, and uh, you'd like to know, uh, you know, what are, you know what's the compensation that you should be offering to someone. Well, the, the compensation databases are meaningful even if you're a five-person company. Right? Because you're, you're that, that's a case of leveraging something that, that's much larger that's out there. Well, in contrast, if you're, if, if you're a 10,000 or 100,000 person company, uh, there's a huge amount you can invest in just uh, analyzing your internal data sets, even without looking outside. So I think the, the question becomes, uh, yeah. I think, OK, no, your point's well taken. Like you can say, well, hey, I'm a small company. I can't afford to do any of this stuff. And I, I would say uh, there are a few things. I mean, one is that uh, if you're a small company, uh, recognize that uh, there are things that you can do that take you down a path of the data being locked up versus easily available. And there can be a trade-off where the way that your data is locked up is a little bit easier, and therefore you want to do that now because the, you know, like that, your biggest concern is just survival or moving forward. This is very, it's a technical debt concept, right? It's, it's, you know, is it worth doing that? I think that if you're uh, a large enterprise you know, and you're not doing these sorts of things already, then yes, the good news, I mean, the bad news is that you have a massive amount of debt. The good news is that you can afford to make the sort of investments to, to resolve it. I think it, it's the, uh, in, in some ways, you could see this guidance is like, like, this is the state you should be aiming for. If you're really small and can't afford it, it's understandable, but the, you should be tracking the debt that you're building up when you do need to eventually get to a place where that data will be available, or you will never be able to uh, uh, take advantage of the data within there. And I mean, part of the beauty of, 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 you know, of, of open source, of cloud computing, is that there are a lot of things small companies can do that equalize the, the playing field. Or if, you're using, if, you, if you decide, I'm going to build on top of public standards, that doesn't necessarily a cost. So I think that these guidelines, in some respects, are even more important when you're making early decisions that could have long, long-lasting impact. But I grant, like the, uh, it's 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 a dilemma that faces you when you basically want to minimize how much time it will get to the thing I want to deliver. It may be that doing the right thing slows you down. Uh, I do think that people overestimate the benefit of that slight efficiency gain sometime and pay, pay heavily afterwards. But yeah. Anyway, thank you all.